say that, as in so many ways, Eleanor Roosevelt was here before I. She was here before most of us. In her persistent articulation of what needs to be fixed in America, she pricked our consciences. It has been said that what she did was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, and that is what makes her live in our memories and why she is such an example to millions of people all over the world today. She used her position of privilege to speak out on behalf of those who had no voice. You must do the same. You must join all of us in Washington who are trying to give a voice to the literally millions and millions of Americans for whom this debate over health care reform is not a political issue, not an abstract academic discussion, but literally a matter of life or death. Who are these Americans? I suggest you look to your right, your left, in front of you, and behind you, because the Americans of whom I speak are all of us, there is not one of us who has the security in this, the greatest of all countries and economies, that we will have health insurance at an affordable price when we need it at any time in our lives now and into the future. For too many Americans, they are one job away from not having health security. They are one divorce away from not having it. They are one illness or accident away. No one in America is secure except the very rich, and that is wrong. Every American deserves health security. This debate will come down to whether or not the Congress of the United States is able to hear and see the problems in front of their eyes and extend health insurance coverage to every American or whether they will hear the well-organized voices of opposition. But that is the way it has always been. Think back. At every point when we were attempting to provide security for every American, we heard the same arguments against doing that. Social security was an issue in the eyes of the opposition that would bankrupt America, would make people lazy, give them no incentive to work to save for their old age. Every argument you hear today was heard then, 60 years ago. Thankfully, we had members of Congress who heard and acted on what they saw in front of their eyes, namely that older people in America deserve to have their retirement secure. I heard Keith say that, as in so many ways, Eleanor Roosevelt was here before I. She was here before most of us. In her persistent articulation of what needs to be fixed in America, she pricked our consciences. It has been said that what she did was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, and that is what makes her live in our memories and why she is such an example to millions of people all over the world today. She used her position of privilege to speak out on behalf of those who had no voice. You must do the same. You must join all of us in Washington who are trying to give a voice to the literally millions and millions of Americans for whom this debate over health care reform is not a political issue, not an abstract academic discussion, but literally a matter of life or death. Who are these Americans? I suggest you look to your right, your left, in front of you, and behind you, because the Americans of whom I speak are all of us. There is not one of us who has the security in this, the greatest of all countries and economies, that we will have health insurance at an affordable price when we need it at any time in our lives, now and into the future. For too many Americans, 
They are one job away from not having health security. They are one divorce away from not having it. They are one illness or accident away. No one in America is secure except the very rich, and that is wrong. Every American deserves health security. This debate will come down to whether or not the Congress of the United States is able to hear and see the problems in front of their eyes and extend health insurance coverage to every American or whether they will hear the well-organized voices of opposition. But that is the way it has always been. Think back. At every point when we were attempting to provide security for every American, we heard the same arguments against doing that. Social security was an issue in the eyes of the opposition that would bankrupt America, would make people lazy, give them no incentive to work, to save for their old age. Every argument you hear today was heard then, 60 years ago. Thankfully, we had members of Congress who heard and acted on what they saw in front of their eyes namely that older people in America deserve to have their retirement secure. <coughs> Try that one one more time. <clears throat> I heard Keith say that, as in so many ways, Eleanor Roosevelt was here before I. She was here before most of us. In her persistent articulation of what needs to be fixed in America, she pricked our consciences. It has been said that what she did was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, and that is what makes her live in our memories and why she is such an example to millions of people all over the world today. She used her position of privilege to speak out on behalf of those who had no voice. You must do the same. You must join all of us in Washington who are trying to give voice to the literally millions and millions of Americans for whom this debate over health care reform is not a political issue, not an abstract academic discussion, but literally a matter of life or death. Who are these Americans? I suggest you look to your right, your left, in front of you, and behind you, because the Americans of whom I speak are all of us. There is not one of us who has the security in this, the greatest of all countries and economies, that we will have health insurance at an affordable price when we need it, at any time in our lives, now and into the future. For too many Americans, they are one job away from not having health security. They are one divorce away from not having it. They are one illness or accident away. No one in America is secure, except the very rich, and that is wrong. Every American deserves health security. This debate will come down to whether or not the Congress of the United States is able to hear and see the problems in front of their eyes and extend health insurance coverage to every American or whether they will hear the well-organized voices of opposition. But that is the way it has always been. Think back at every point when we were attempting to provide security for every American, we heard the same arguments against doing that. Social Security was an issue in the eyes of the opposition that would bankrupt America, would make people lazy, give them no incentive to work, to save for their old age. Every argument you hear today was heard then, 60 years ago. Thankfully, we had members of Congress who had heard and acted on what they saw in front of their eyes, namely that older people in America deserve to have their retirement secure. <clears throat> we have heard the same arguments when it comes to the minimum wage. Oh my goodness, if you raise the minimum wage, no businesses will be able to continue. Small business will be bankrupt. There will be no opportunities for economic expansion. Again, the opposition was wrong, and the people who care about what happens to ordinary, average-working, middle-class Americans were right. 
And what we have to do is to build on social legislation like Social Security, Medicare, the minimum wage, all of which made America stronger to make sure we give universal health care coverage to every American because that will make America stronger as well. Now, during the next weeks, people will say we don't really need universal coverage. We can get by without it. Well, you know that that is just not the case. Universal coverage is essential to help control and contain health care costs. Without it, those of you in this hall who have health insurance will continue to subsidize people who do not. You will continue to pay for those whose employers and those employees who do not pay for themselves. That is not fair. If you have everyone in the system, you can begin to make sure that costs do not get shifted from the uninsured and the underinsured to those of us with insurance. That is the kind of system that will make it possible for us to take care of more people, to emphasize primary and preventive health care, to make sure that we retain choice because we will have a system in which individuals will get to choose who their doctor is to make sure that what we do will put us on a firm financial footing for the future. And yet there will be those who say, no, we cannot do this. It will not work. Let me suggest to you, there is a very simple set of questions to ask. Those who say universal coverage will not work, ask them if they want to repeal Social Security or Medicare. Ask them if they are willing to give up on what those two programs have done to make Americans secure. If you hear from members of Congress that they do not believe that hard-working middle-class Americans should have health insurance coverage, ask them then why have they figured out a way to give members of Congress guaranteed affordable health care coverage. Some members of Congress do not like it when I say that. They do not like it when I suggest that you ask your member of Congress, especially those who are not in favor of universal co coverage, why they can do it for themselves and not for your neighbors, friends, and relatives. But for those members of Congress who are fighting to give Americans what they have, which is guaranteed affordable health care coverage, make sure they know that you will recognize their commitment and help support them in the battles to come. So that one again. <clears throat> We have heard the same arguments when it comes to the minimum wage. Oh my goodness, if you raise the minimum wage, no businesses will be able to continue. Small business will be bankrupt. There will be no opportunities for economic expansion. Again, the opposition was wrong, and the people who care about what happens to ordinary, average working, middle class Americans were right. And what we have to do is to build on social legislation like Social Security, Medicare, the minimum wage, all of which made America stronger, to make sure we give universal health care coverage to every American because that will make America stronger as well. Now during the next weeks, people will say we don't really need universal coverage. We can get by without it. Well. You know that that is just not the case. Universal coverage is essential to help control and contain health care costs. Without it, those of you in this hall who have health insurance will continue to subsidize people who do not. You will continue to pay for those whose employers and those employees who do not pay for themselves. That is not fair. 
if you have everyone in the system, you can begin to make sure that, that costs do not get shifted from the uninsured and the underinsured to those of us with insurance. That is the kind of system that will make it possible for us to take care of more people, to emphasize primary and preventive health care, to make sure that we retain choice because we will have a system in which individuals will get to choose who their doctor is to make sure that what we do will put us on a firm financial footing for the future. And yet there will be those who say, no, we cannot do this, it will not work. Let me suggest to you there is a very simple set of questions to ask. Those who say universal coverage will not work Ask them if they want to repeal Social Security or Medicare. Ask them if they are willing to give up on what those two programs have done to make Americans secure. If you hear from members of Congress that they do not believe that hard-working, middle-class Americans should have health insurance coverage, ask them then why have they figured out a way to give members of Congress guaranteed affordable health care coverage. Some members of Congress do not like it when I say that. They do not like it when I suggest that you ask your member of Congress, especially those who are not in favor of universal coverage, why they can do it for themselves and not for your neighbors, friends, and relatives, but for those members of Congress who are fighting to give Americans what they have, which is guaranteed affordable health care coverage, make sure they know that you will recognize their commitment and help support them in the battles to come. <coughs> Try that one one more time. We have heard the same arguments when it comes to the minimum wage. Oh my goodness, if you raise the minimum wage, no businesses will be able to continue. Small business will be bankrupt. There will be no opportunities for economic expansion. Again, the opposition was wrong and the people who care about what happens to ordinary average working middle class Americans were right. And what we have to do is to build on social legislation like Social Security, Medicare, the minimum wage, all of which made America stronger to make sure we give universal health care coverage to every American because that will make America stronger as well. Now, during the next weeks, people will say we don't really need universal coverage. We can get by without it. Well, you know that that is just not the case. Universal coverage is essential to help control and contain health care costs. Without it, those of you in this hall who have health insurance will continue to subsidize people who do not. You will continue to pay for those whose employers and those employees who do not pay for themselves. But that is not fair. If you have everyone in the system, you can begin to make sure that costs do not get shifted from the uninsured and the underinsured to those of us with insurance. But that is the kind of system that will make it possible for us to take care of more people to emphasize primary and preventive health care, to make sure that we retain choice because we will have a system in which individuals will get to choose who their doctor is, to make sure that what we do will put us on a firm financial footing for the future. Okay, direct my plans attorney. Here we go. Mr. Clary, do you recall about what time during your shift that day, that the accident involving Mrs. Packard occurred, I think it was between seven and eight. I haven't got an exact time. I can't remember. Between seven and eight p.m., yes. Were there any other employees on duty besides yourself on that day? Approximately at that time, yes. How many? There was a box boy and two cashiers. Do you remember their names? One of them was Frank Taylor. I'm not sure if the other was Ken Donaldson. Sherry Elliott was also on duty. On this date, May 11, 1991, 
those were the only employees besides yourself? I'm pretty sure. That's correct, yes. There was a meat man, but I'm not sure which butcher was working the department that day. Was he somewhere back in the meat department? Yes, I guess. Please speak directly into the microphone, Mr. Clary, so the court reporter can hear you. Do you know if any of these people have left the employee of Food Basket? No, they haven't. They are all still there? The ones I just said, yes. Do you know the store number there? Yes, it is 720. Do you have a specific way of referring to the food basket located at 4301 14th Street in Washington, D.C., 14th Street or 720? From now on, when I refer to this store at 4301 14th Street, I will refer to it as the 14th Street store. Right. Please answer clearly with a yes or no answer. Yes, okay, Your Honor. At the 14th Street store on or about May 11, 1991, was it a practice to stack cases of canned goods for display purposes at the end of the aisles? Yes, it was. Who usually did the stacking? Bill Delgado, the store manager. Does anybody else besides the store manager stack the cases on the end caps? I do, and also the third man. At the time, we were all involved in setting up the merchandise displays. Who was the third man at the time? George Cummings. I will show you a photograph that was taken immediately after the incident. I will show it first to counsel. Yes, I am familiar with this. The photograph is marked on the back as plaintiff's photo number 1C. Were these marked for identification? Yes, Your Honor. I will ask you to take a look at that photograph. Do you recognize what it depicts? Yes, I do. What does it depict? An end cap display of Mountain Pride mixed vegetables. What location in the store was this display? At the end of the aisle, aisle 15. As far as north, west, east, or south, where is aisle 15? It's at the south end. It's near the south exit in the store. When you say end cap, what are you referring to? Gondola or table? These are the tables. It's a long gondola with shelving all around. Now, with respect to this photograph, the cans of Mountain Pride vegetables are displayed at the end of the gondola. Is that correct? Yes, they are. Would you describe the composition of this entire display? The gondolas are three cases wide, approximately four cases, possibly five cases. I can't tell by this photo high along the back of the display. Let's go to photograph 1B, which appears to be a clearer picture of the same display. And again, was this marked 1B previously? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, I've seen it. Now, you said the cases that appear in front of the bin were not there on the date of Mrs. Packard's accident. Well, again, please speak up, Mr. Clary. If you are not sure, just tell us that. I'm trying to think. At that time, they may have been there, but generally, this isn't a practice to display merchandise cases in tiers of six cans. But they may or may not have been there on the date of Mrs. Packard's accident. Is that correct? That's right. The usual manner that the customers take the cans when they shop from that display is to take them out of the dump bin. Please take a look at Plaintiff's 1B, referring to the cases that are stacked on the back of the gondola, the very bottom case of the stack. What is that case resting on? Other cans are on the bin. In this particular display, 
I would say it's on the bin itself. By looking at the photo 1B or 1C, are you able to tell whether it's resting on the other cans or on the bottom of the bin itself? From the size of the case, I would say it would be on the bin itself. I'm almost positive that three food cases will fit inside the bin, especially the way they're set. It is so far from the perimeter wall. <coughs> Let's go by plaintiff's attorney. Mr. Clary, do you recall about what time during your shift that day that the accident involving Mrs. Packard occurred? I think it was between 7 and 8. I haven't got an exact time. I can't remember. Between 7 and 8 p.m.? Yes. <coughs> Were there any other employees on duty besides yourself on that date? Approximately at that time? Yes. How many? There was a box boy and two cashiers. Do you remember their names? One of them was Frank Taylor. I'm not sure if the other was Ken Donaldson. Sherry Elliott was also on duty. On this date, May 11, 1991, those were the only employees besides yourself? I'm pretty sure that's correct, yes. There was a meat man, but I'm not sure which butcher was working the department that day. Was he somewhere back in the meat department? Yes, I guess. Please speak directly into the microphone, Mr. Clary, so the court reporter can hear you. Do you know if any of these people have left the employee a food basket? No, they haven't. They are all still there, the ones I just said, yes. Do you know the store number there? Yes, it is 720. Do you have a specific way of referring to the food basket located at 4301? 14th Street in Washington, D.C., 14th Street or 720. From now on, when I refer to this store at 4301 14th Street, I will refer to it as the 14th Street store, right? Please answer clearly with a yes or no answer. Yes, okay, Your Honor. At the 14th Street store on or about May 11, 1991, was it a practice to stack cases of canned goods for display purposes at the end of the aisles? Yes, it was. Who usually did the stacking? Bill Delgado, the store manager. Does anybody else besides the manager stack the cases on the end caps? 